Next, from Springfield, Senator Cullerton holds a press conference and expresses his frustration over the grand bargain budget delay. This runs about 20 minutes. Hey guys, how are you? Hi. Just wanted to uh, comment a little bit about uh, what we did today. Um, called one bill that's part of the grand bargain, which uh, passed. We still have others that we need to pass. Uh, a couple of those were uh, Senator Rodonio's bills. Uh, she pulled them out of the record. Uh, one of the bills was a property tax freeze that she introduced on January 11th. Had she called the bills, we would have passed it. Uh, so what's happened since January 11th is that she's been asked to not call those bills by the governor's office because it doesn't have uh, enough of a reform from his point of view. So that's where we are. The January 11th, we put these bills in because we wanted to get them passed quickly to get them over to the House so that they could look at the effort to accommodate the governor in his request to have some reforms along with revenue so that we can have a balanced budget. Instead, the governor has delayed the Republicans till May 10th, where there's only 20 days left in the session. So obviously, it's time to call the grand bargain. We have made numerous changes to these bills that when they were filed, all going towards accommodating the Republicans and the governor's office. But you can only go so far and still have votes to pass these bills. And we believe that we've just about exhausted those efforts to compromise on the reforms. Now, in the meantime, we've started to work on a budget, which takes much longer. And we're making progress. We have meetings on the budget. Senator Brady is involved. Senator uh, uh, McConkie and uh, Carter have offered their own bills. Senator Rose is involved and Ryder. Our budgeteers, and we're making progress. It involves revenue. It involves a tax increase. We're accommodating the Republicans' request to put limits on that. But what's at stake here is that we have enormous debt, and if we don't pass revenue before the end of the month, it'll be very difficult to pass it before the end of the year. It'll be very difficult to pass it next year in an election year, and we will owe $24 billion, according to the governor, on Election Day. And we only bring in $31.5 billion. We'll have hit junk bond status maybe by the end of this month if we don't do this. So what's wrong with passing the property tax reform bill that Senator Rodonia herself introduced? And by the way, these are bills that our members, some of them think it's bad policy, they don't want to vote for it, but I was able to convince them in a structured roll call to get enough votes. We're not paying the Jewish social services, the Lutheran social services, the Catholic charities. We're not paying the RTA money we own. We're not paying for the school districts, the categoricals we own. Even though we've all authorized the spending of these things, we don't have enough money. We're spending $7.5 billion more than we have coming in. We're trying to stop it. That's why there's an urgency to not just keep on going on with negotiations. We got to the point where it's time to decide. And we're ready. I've got my caucus ready to vote for some bills we don't want to vote for. A pension reform. We called that already. Didn't have enough votes because they didn't vote for it. These are things that haven't even been offered in the House. That's why we can't wait till the last day. They haven't even d debated these things. They want to. They've indicated they do. So that's why I asked the uh, Senator Rodonia to call the bills today, I'd be more than happy to go in to any meeting and explain why I can't go any further than I already have. Be happy to. But at some point, we have to then call the, the bills. A better tactic, perhaps from the governor's office, would have been to just let the Senate pass these bills over to the House, not have to sign off on them, and then negotiate with the five legislative leaders. But that didn't happen. That's why Senator Rodonia, at her request, not mine, initiated this grand bargain.
happy to answer any questions. For future negotiations, if you watch, we've all watched this since January. You're coming out of the Senate, what keeps us? Why? Why should we not go out and tell people that the only two groups of Democrats and Republicans who have been talking to each other are not even talking now? You know? Senator Rodonio and I talk all the time. And then you go ask her. So, a, 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 ask her. A, ask her why she couldn't call the bills. Because it wasn't me. Didn't I didn't tell her not to call the bills. I said I'm willing to go to any meeting and explain how we got to the point where we were able to offer what we can offer and why we can't get any more votes to offer any more in the areas of workers' comp and property tax freezes. We've agreed on pensions, but they didn't vote for it. What conversations have you had with the governor, and why has he told you he's keeping votes? Because it doesn't go far enough. How? Far enough how, in his view? When he tells you it doesn't go far enough, what does he mean? Well, we would, we would explain, for example, property tax freezes, permanent property tax freezes for all school districts, as if they're all equally financially uh, even. That's not good policy. Our caucus won't vote for that. Can we vote for a two-year? Yeah, that's what we were prepared to vote for. Then he wants five years. Well, what about those school districts? So we've tried to accommodate him, try to put myself in his shoes. He hasn't done this before. He's never passed a bill in the two years he's been here where so he's working on. Have Absolutely. Have with Senator Redonio, because that's what my caucus said. We worked with Senator Redonio. She's the one that started this initiative. And workers' comp, too. Exactly. Yes. You look at, uh, I think we filed uh, Senate Bill 4 on, uh, I'm sorry, Amendment Number 4 to Senate Bill 12. That's, the, that's what we, we were going to vote on today. It's probably a, over $100 million worth of savings in workers' comp reforms after just passing a major reform in 2011. As if the crisis that we have in our budget, in our, in our state, is, should, should turn on uh, some language that may or may not be found in a workers' comp bill. It's just absurd. Mr. President, it sounds like the governor doesn't want a resolution if he's uh, keeping changing what well, he wants. That, that's, that's, if that's the case, then that's time to uh, apparently not pass the, the grand bargain and turn to the budget and let just pass a budget. Like Speaker Madigan and I have asked, let's focus on a budget. He's the one that asked for the reforms. I'm the one that put him out here along with Senator Rodonio, and he's the one that's saying that they don't go far enough. And I try to explain that you have to get people, I, I don't, this isn't the private sector where I just go around and fire people if they don't vote for something. I, I get them to convince them to vote for it. There's principles involved with these things. We have interest groups that are working against us, right? Everybody knows that. So I understand this because I have done this a lot, but the governor doesn't, apparently. That's why it's so frustrating. It's been two years, Mr. President, and the governor is now running commercials that make it look like somebody else has been governor. I'm glad you mentioned the commercials. He's talking about a balanced budget in his commercials. He didn't inter even introduce a balanced budget. And the budget that he did introduce has $4.5 billion. And you know what that line item is for? No. It's got a, it, it's got a name. The grand bargain, the same grand bargain that he's saying we shouldn't call today. So I'm uh, uh, obviously frustrated because we've been trying to work together. It's been great actually working together with the Senate Republicans and including the, the senators on the budget that I mentioned. Some come from pretty conservative areas. We've been trying to reach. We've made a lot of progress. But it all involves a tax increase, an income tax increase that we need Republicans to vote for. Is Peter Redonio to call those bills today, what did she say? What the reason? Well, it's implicit that there would be, you know, maybe only one person voting for him from their side of the aisle, and therefore it wouldn't pass, and therefore why go through that process? But I, I'll tell you one thing she did was she took it out of the record, and I called it, and she took it out of the record. So that's a statement. Are you saying for sure there is no room to maneuver any more on workers' comp and property tax freezes? Well, you don't know what we have offered, uh, with the possible exception of the workers' comp. I think the amendment that was filed today 
We've been working on this for two months. We've been making concessions. If you count the budget, we've made about 36 changes. So we haven't filed all of them. We could do that, I guess, and say this is the final final. Sometimes that's viewed offensively. But I know what I can get. I know how many votes I can get for these things. And I know what we're bumping up against. And all we're talking about is passing it over to the House. <laughs> that's the part that this isn't a final, final going to the, uh, be signed by the governor. We don't even have discussions with the House members. That's how uh, I just disagree with the tactic of killing this or trying to kill it in the, in the, in the Senate. Yes, what are your talks like with the governor when you tell him these things? I'm respectful. I uh, explain the policy. I explain the limitations I have with regard to the policy and positions of my caucus and the interest groups. I'm happy to t go back to 1979 and talk about sales tax on uh, food and medicine, if that's what he wants to know the background of. I. I talk. I, he, he has kind of solid positions that he thinks we, he can just get more. I think it's the difference between the private sector and, and just checks and balances of the legislature. Does that mean that there is a potential to never have a deal if this is how? Well, we, we, if we can't, we can't pass it unilaterally, we would then turn to passing a budget. And, and hopefully we pass a budget with Republicans. If they don't want to vote for it, we'll try to pass it with Democrats. How do you pass a budget if you can't pass this, if you can't pass it? Well, we can only, you know what, uh, Monique, I can only do what, what is within, you know, our, uh, our powers in our own caucus and in our own chamber. So I can call bills and I can ask members to vote for things. What conversations have you had with the Speaker about the grant bargain? We've heard from rank and file that they encourage you, but is the Speaker encouraging this? Well, I, I haven't talked to him about the grand bargain because the, the, the whole purpose of this was to work with Senate Republicans. And there was a kind of an implicit agreement that this was going to be within the Senate, okay? I do agree with the Speaker that we need to have a budget. It's the most pri uh, obvious priority. And so does, you know, uh, Governor Ryan, and Edgar, and, and probably Thompson. That's what we, that's what we do. That's the first thing you do. And do we touch on these other issues as well? Of course we do. But you don't, as the speaker would say, hold them hostage. The speaker's willing to talk about these other things as well. I'm sure he is. But we just happen to, with Senator Radona's suggestion, tie them all together. It makes it easier to pass. Republicans voting for a tax increase. Tie it in with the reforms. Okay, that was the tactic we're using. And the governor's the one that's keeping it from passing. Again, are you saying, if you came in and said, it indicated at the beginning, that you've gone as far as you can go on workers' yeah. comp and property tax. Have you gone as far as you can go? I, I would say, to try to answer that as honest as I can, if, if somebody came up with a different concept that accomplished the same goal but was more politically pal palatable, I would be open to that. I, you can't never say that you're not open to negotiations, but we are running out of time. So, yeah, I guess we have to say by a certain date we're closed for business. I'm not going to call any more bills. I'm not saying that. These bills, uh, everybody knows the issues, but it's, it's, there's 20 days, and we have the House to deal with as well. Have, have, have there been any discussions about reopening the 2005 statute that really set costs up? You're talking about workers' comp? We, we have been talking about workers' comp for for the entire time since we passed that bill four years ago. The, the, there was an incredible amount of work that was put into that bill four years ago. I know there were some things back in 2005 where people say, why don't you undo some of that? To, we've, we've discussed that. They are not, I don't believe any of those elements found their way in here. I, I want you to score, if you want to do it that way, the, the, use that term. Look at Senate Amendment Number 4. It's got about 12 changes to the workers, maybe not many, maybe seven changes to the workers' comp. The biggest thing is the reduction in, in the medical fee schedule. Saves over $85 million. The other provisions save money. I have no idea why that's not enough. I can't, when, when the unions are against it and the trial lawyers are against it, good luck. How many votes do you want me to get? 30? 
the Democrats have had three years also to introduce legislation, and forgive me if I uh, am mistaken that it hasn't been introduced to study why premiums have not come down from the 11 reforms. You know, that's a very good point because you've reminded me that at the request of Senator Redonio and the Republicans, we didn't put any changes in this bill dealing with insurance companies at their request because that takes away votes from a workers' comp reform from their perspective. The, so, again, I'm trying to do this in a bipartisan fashion. I have to check with my counterpart if we're going to put anything in this bill. So, yeah, we got a lot of people in our caucus who want to go after the insurance companies and say, how come if we... Uh, if it's been recommended that you lower premiums by 30 percent, how come they haven't been lowered by 30 percent? Well, do I want to put bills in there to do that? Yes, but as a request to try to get a balanced budget. Do you know what's going to happen with workers' comp? This is important. The Sen Senator Verdonio has probably five or six people who would never vote for workers' comp because it doesn't have causation in it. So there's, we're already starting off with no votes. We have to get to 30. It's just a matter of legislative... Look, at I... I I've said this before, I've passed a lot of bills. I know how to pass bills. You've you got to get to the point. These guys don't know how to govern. They haven't had a lot of practice. And you, at some point in time, you have to just agree, okay, let's make a deal. And you have to understand the other side and understand how far they can go. And what's at stake here is a disaster after the next 20 days if we don't have any revenue. What's the future of the House Appropriation Bill dealing with social services and higher ed, the special fund bill? We, it's, it's a supplemental, which we've already passed. It's already part of the grand bargain. All, the, all that money that's in those funds has been appropriated. I'm not sure what the bill number is, but we've already passed it. So, uh, yeah, it, it has. It's, we've passed a supplemental for... Uh, for it's tied to the grand bargain because we want to pass the grand bargain. That's another one of the benefits of voting for the grand bargain. You've appropriated that money. That's why it's tied together. That was what their request was. Okay? So it's still, if this thing falls apart, we'll have to go back and revisit that. But for now, our answer to that is those monies are already appropriated. The school districts are not getting their money even though there's an appropriation. So, so it's not a matter of you can't, you don't keep them open by authorizing spending. You keep them open by giving them money. If we pass revenue, if we pass revenue, they'll get the money. So, so, so the point is, if you just appropriate the money with no, with no uh, revenue, it's just like not giving them. It's like not appropriating the money. That's the same question she just asked. Where it's on hold, and all of the monies that are, that are in there have already been appropriated in the bill that we already passed. It's tied to the grand bargain. Has to I'd love to go up and talk to him right now. Are you going to go up and talk yes, to him? I'll see you later.